sports are really important vehicles for relationships. We have purpose. We have a why. We bring people together. We connect. I feel like God is our greatest supporter and our greatest coach. Welcome to Rabbi on the Sidelines from Sinai Temple. I'm Rabbi Ere Sherman. We are here to speak about the intersection of sports and faith. This week, we are joined by NBA veteran Mike Jaminski, the number seven pick in the NBA draft. He left Duke University as the leader in points, in rebounds, and in blocks. He is now an ACC Network college basketball broadcaster. He has an amazing, inspirational story of hope through addiction and sobriety and Rebound Institute. And we are thrilled and honored that Mike Jaminski is joining us this week. Mike, it's so uh, it's a pleasure to have you and to I, I've seen your work over so many years and it's wonderful to speak to you in person. Thanks for joining. Rabbi, thank you so much. And uh, I tell you what, the, the background picture, I owe that photographer a ton of money for getting me to block a shot from Kareem, who is the greatest center that I ever played against. Uh, so that uh, I've actually got a photo of that, too. It's a very special memory for me. I was thinking of which photo to show Mike Jaminski <laughs> and you know, we're in Los Angeles, so I might get yep. some slack for that, but uh, uh, I have family in Philadelphia, so the Sixers over the Lakers for that one with Magic Johnson uh, watching in the background, for sure. Yep. Um, so we're going to start with the mundane and the ordinary, which is basketball, even though it meant so much in your life, and then we're going to move towards the sacred. Okay. So basketball, you grew up in Monroe, Connecticut, and you end up at Duke University before Coach K. I want to ask a question about Coach K before we're end, ending here today. Mm -hmm. um, but what was your journey? I know you, what, you were 6'11". By the time you were age 15, you basically had basketball written all over it. Um, was it something that just came naturally, something that your parents wanted you to do? What was the basketball journey? Well, I was actually, I loved baseball growing up. And, uh, you know, as I, I kept uh, kept growing and growing, and back then there were no Randy Johnsons or any tall players that I could really emulate. So uh, basketball kind of presented itself to me. And um, I really started playing only competitively in the eighth grade. Um, it, you know, I was, uh, I had some allergy issues and asthma issues growing up, but, um, you know, that was my start. And then you know, going, I kept, I was six, five in the eighth grade, six, seven as a freshman, kept growing two inches a year. And you talked wow. about, you know, me and my, so always, always tall. And uh, I started getting recruited in, uh, in, in my freshman year, I was starting on the varsity and, uh, you know, it just word recruiting was a lot different then. the mm -hmm. assistant coaches were on the road all the time. They had to go to small towns to find players and, uh, you know, but if you were if you were a talent, they would find you. And, um, you know, I, I just uh, kind of narrowed down. I guess the, the story that's different is I decided to graduate from high school after three years. Right. Uh, which was uh, unusual then, not so unusual now with reclassification and guys moving up and down. But I, I felt that uh, the league that I played in wasn't going to be much of a challenge for me in my senior year. And I thought a freshman year in college would be more beneficial. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's what I went with. It's interesting. It's like the exact opposite. Now that kids go to prep school and it's doing five, six years or red shirt yeah. until they get there. <laughs> and here you said, you know what, I'm going to make that jump. Um, take us to Duke because Coach K really wasn't there yet. And it wasn't necessarily the program that we know today. Um, what was the inspiration to go there? And I know you're still connected there. We had another mm -hmm. great uh, Blue Devil on here a couple of months ago with uh, Jay Billis. Um, and why, why Duke? And then how do you see that trajectory from when you went to Duke to what it is today? Um, well, it, it, it was Duke basketball is a continuum. And, um, you know, a coach named Vic Bubis, had really great teams at Duke in the 60s for the whole decade. And then he left and things dropped off. Um, they hired my coach, Bill Foster from Utah, who was known as a, uh, a t you know, a program builder. And he came in and uh, recruited me. And uh, I, you know, I, I saw things trending in the right direction. Jim Spinarkle was the class ahead of me. Um, you know, then I joined in, um, and Duke was really a, it's, it's different today than it was then, but there were, uh, you know, I knew there's that I wanted to leave the Northeast 
uh, the Big East didn't exist at that time. Uh, ACC was the best conference for basketball. And Duke was a great fit because a lot of their student body was from the Northeast, but it was in North, it was in Durham, North Carolina. So it was really the best of both worlds for me. It was a perfect fit, great academic school. And, uh, you know, I loved Coach Foster, and I loved the direction that things were going in. So when you leave the school, you're the leader in blocks, rebounds, and points. And I know when somebody sets a record, they want to stay up there. But then as it was broken, I think you're, what, number uh, 10 or something, or eight on the list in scoring right now. Um, what does it feel like, number one, to set that record, and then number two years later when it's actually broken? Is that a sense of pride? Is that a sense of what is that like? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a cool story that um, – Actually, Johnny Dawkins broke my record in 1986. And, uh, and then fast forward to J.J. Redick, and, mm-hmm. um, and he broke Johnny's record. Now, when the, I was broadcasting the game when J.J. did that, oh, wow. and uh, Johnny was an assistant coach, so all three of us were in the building. And Johnny, before the game, came up to me and pulled an envelope out of his out of his jacket. And he said, do you know what this is? And I'm, I'm like, no. And he says, this is the letter you wrote me when I broke your scoring record. Oh, my gosh. And then he pulled another envelope out. And he said, this is a letter that I've written to JJ to give oh. him after tonight. And it was really so surreal because I was in the broadcast position. I was right on line for Reddick taking the shot and Johnny stood up on the bench and the three of us were like right in line. The basket goes in, he breaks the record. Uh, but that's, that's a snapshot of what the Duke brotherhood is, is all about. Actually in our tradition, we call it La Dorvador from generation to generation. Yep. And three people coming, I mean, you Dawkins and Reddick coming from really different backgrounds, but forming that family there and passing that uh, literal ball down from generation to generation. I love it. And what about Coach K now that this continuum continues with, you know, taking somebody in the family with uh, Coach John Shire, uh, mm-hmm. actually uh, an active member in the Jewish community who has played yep. uh, representing the United States in Israel. Uh, what do you think of Shire taking over and that whole continuum of coaches also, right? He, Coach K retiring, taking the one-year bow, uh, Coach uh, Williams leaving sort of sudden, and then uh, my man Coach Beheim still sticking around. Yeah, it's, um, you know, there's, it's going to be a changing of the guard for sure. And I mean, you've got, you've got Hall of Fame coaches that you all that you just mentioned, and then Leonard Hamilton down at uh, Florida State is 72 as well. (laughs) Um, You know, right now, Tony Bennett looks to be the heir apparent is, you know, he's won a national championship at Virginia already. But uh, yeah, some great, great people and coaches leaving, uh, you know, for Coach K, I was there at the beginning when they hired mm-hmm. him. And uh, his first couple of years were, were not real smooth. And, uh, you know, he, the, the thing that saved him was the recruiting class of Dawkins and Billis yeah. and Allery and, and Henderson, that group. Um, he turned things around. He was very competitive. He wanted to compete against Dean Smith at North Carolina. And at the same time, Jim Valvano was coming into right. NC State and Bobby Kremens was coming into Georgia Tech. So they were the young lions trying to get up on top. And so here's a little clip of you speaking about the NBA draft when you were drafted. Uh, it's actually with J.R. Reed. And you said something interesting that we'll listen to that I think is a beautiful le- uh, life lesson and a lesson of faith. Well, there was no digital network. <laughs> it wasn't carried live on any TV. Um, but you know what? The, the process was so much different. There was no draft combine. Um, the Nets came down and interviewed me. It's the only team that did interview me during that whole process. I flew up to New York. Uh, I knew that's where I was going to get drafted. But I think the one thing that's, that's consistent, JR, is the anticipation and the anxiety before you get picked and then the relief after it happens. Absolutely, Mark. I think that's a really important point, not just about basketball, but about life. The anticipation and the anxiety that occurs in a moment like that. Um, take us through that moment, but maybe we can talk about it in the more global level of going through life with anticipation and anxiety, not knowing what will come next. Well, I, you know, the thing uh, when I was going through that, uh, there weren't any mock drafts like they have now. I mean, they have those starting a year before the actual draft. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I don't know necessarily know that that's a great idea either. But, um, you know, for me, 
I, I just, I, you, you let your four years in college, that's your resume. And uh, mm -hmm. as I said in that uh, video, the Nets came down. It looked like they were they had the sixth and seventh pick that year in the draft. And they wound up taking Mike O'Corn, who was from New Jersey, who played at North Carolina, who I played against. And, you know, we become fast friends. We come in as rookies, not knowing what we don't know and, uh, you know, made our way through the league. And, you know, for ang anxiety, it's just the, the fear of the unknown mm -hmm. of things that you really have no control over. You spend a lot of time, I think, wasting energy on on that. And, uh, you know, and as far as, you know, with my faith, that's that's a known quantity. And, uh, you know, that's never an unknown for me. So mm -hmm. that really helps me when I face those situations about, you know, what am I going to do going forward? So what was your faith background uh, growing up? Um, and did that play into any of your sports uh, career, at least up until the NBA? Yeah, I was um, I, I was I was baptized in the Catholic Church, um, really got turned away from religion because was at a young age. I went to it was a cat. It was a Polish diocese mm -hmm. and the mass was done in Polish. Got it. So I didn't understand. I, I kneeled when everybody kneeled. I stood when people stood and I sat when they sat. And that's about it. And, uh, yeah. you know, my spiritual journey early was kind of was on my own. And, uh, you know, my playing days in the NBA, I, I gravitated to the Presbyterian Church. Hmm. Um, and so my faith has always been strong. Um, we'll talk about when I was uh angry with god um mm -hmm. and but still the faith the, the faith was there and it's been so instrumental for me in the last two years so let's go to the court in the nba this is uh the nets playing the celtics uh you against robert Parrish, and we'll talk about uh i don't know are there miracles on the court or is it just the skill and talent robert to the rest eight to four celtics G with that game Sunday, wasn't it? Celtics and Great. Sixers. Nice move. Good rebound by G. Toronto. Got the wrong guy. Right. Instead of cat, cat Just one of many uh, amazing games from you on the Nets. Uh, I see the smirk there as you're watching that. What does it feel like watching that uh, so many years later? Well, you know, and, and that game, somebody, uh, again, somebody I'm beholden to, um, it was a game that I scored 41. I had both career yes. highs in the same game at 41 points, 23 rebounds against maybe one of the greatest teams in the history of our sport, the 86 Celtics. So that was very special for me. For one night, I was the best player on the planet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I only visited where some where Larry Bird lived for his career or where Parrish and uh, McHale were hall of famers, you know, but, uh, the, the funny thing is, the next game I had 37 and uh, against the Hawks, and uh, but then you know I, I settled into my normal you know range where I was. But uh, that that game is is very very special to me. And what is the grind like on an NBA level? I mean, it's not just like a college you know a game here, a game there. Obviously, they're you know playing a pretty major schedule right now. But like to keep that up and at 14 years in the NBA. Um, just a lot of success. How, how do you how do you do that physically, but also emotionally and spiritually to keep it up at that level? It was um, it was such a shock to me when I went from Duke to my rookie year. Um, just to give you an example, and this is back when they have subsequently banned this, but when they played three games in three days, wow. um, we would do that during the course of the season. And one weekend in particular, we play, we play the Lakers at home in New Jersey on Friday night. We play the Pistons in Detroit on Saturday night. And then we flew to Washington, bust right to the Capitol Center and played the Bullets at one o'clock on Sunday. Wow. Yeah, I just, you know, we went out. We, people slept on the locker room floor. <laughs> we showered and went out and, you know, got hammered. Um, <laughs> but that was that was life. In the, and plus, there is that there was no chartering back then. We flew commercially and I flew wow. commercially for the first 10 years of my career, which adds a whole nother layer onto it. Uh huh. Uh huh. But, um, you know, and, and the thing, too, and, and um, I, you know, I talked about Michael Korn. He was very active in the uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes at mm -hmm. North Carolina. 
Mm-hmm. And he was the one of um, he was one of the the guys who started. Uh, we had a um, we had a Bible study before every game, and every home game. And then also most teams had one, you know, in their home run. So we encouraged. We had guys from the visiting team come in with us before the game, <coughs> um, and you know it was it was conducted. Uh, a guy named Albert Long did it for us in. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, New Jersey, but, uh, that was something that virtually every team had. Yeah. You know, I was just talking to an NBA center who's playing in the game right now. And he said like 45 minutes before tip off, there's a prayer group uh, from yep. both teams, both yep. teams, right. That, uh, gather by choice, of course, uh, separation of church and state. Um, but that it's really interesting to hear that these, ritual faith aspects are actually occurring in the arena in real time and i think it's a it seems like that people that i've been speaking to it's an important piece of not just getting through the grind but actually um allowing them to spiritually grow as well absolutely and uh, you know and i I can't stress you know i wish that people could be inside a locker room sometime it's the least divisive most disparate you know place on on the planet really and you know i've i've had the good fortune uh, and again it's you, you know it's just not the home team it's <coughs> guys from the other team and it's open to everybody and there was never anything no animosity or anything from the guys who didn't participate you know mm-hmm. that was just our choice and uh, it was a it was a beautiful moment you know before a game so we speak about uh God, you said we're going to speak about in a few moments uh, when you were angry at God. And I always actually say that um, a rabbi or a priest, I wouldn't go to that rabbi or a priest if they had 100% faith in God. And I mean that in the most sincere way, meaning no, we know. deal with God by actually dealing with our own doubts and our own doubts of faith as well. Um, I got to learn about you as a kid actually watching those ACC games on Sunday night with uh, Jim Spinarkle. Yeah, uh, that Syracuse has joined the ACC, watching you do some uh, Syracuse games as well. Um, but during these past few years, um, you had some doubts in God, and I want to share with you first. Um, actually, maybe we can share first your story um, of addiction and sobriety over the last few years. You mentioned in some of the clips that you were dealing with this during the NBA, but didn't really show. But I believe uh, a couple of years ago at the passing of your fiance of blessed memory, um, you really had some hard times. So if you're willing to maybe just share a bit of, about that. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, it started really in, in 2000 and uh, my marriage was not in a great place and was not getting better. Um, and my my ex-wife's business failed. And uh, so that uh, that took a huge hit on me or made a huge hit on me financially. You know, we wound up getting divorced and then I meet Sarah Culpepper, who uh, fell in love with each other. She was 23 years younger than me. And, um, you know, we got engaged and I uh, thought things were, you know, the ship was riding. And then she passed away and uh, we got engaged in 2013. She passed away in 2015 because of complications from uh, of her liver and a congenital heart defect um, at the age of 32. Wow. And that just it sort of short circuited my wiring. There, as I, I just like, and and rather than do the thing that I should have done, which is seek professional help, I decided to self medicate, and and started drinking really heavily. Um, you know, and and this was over this was over the course of of five years or so before I sought treatment. But there was those catastrophic life events that I, I couldn't deal with. I was, and then especially with the death of Sarah, I was so angry at God. I mean, I'd cry every night myself to sleep and just, you know, curse at him and say, and ask the question, why, why did this happen? Cause I was always worried about me predeceasing her with mm-hmm. a lot of her life left to lead. So I just, you know, I, I'd like to say none of this went as I had planned, but uh, you know that that's <laughs> exactly not many things go as you planned. No, absolutely. And it's interesting you speak about the basketball family earlier, the Duke family, the NBA family. And you said when you were a rookie, who brought you under your wing. And in fact, when another player was a rookie, Jason Williams, you brought him under your wing. Jason Williams, very well known, not just for his basketball prowess at St. John's and uh, within the NBA, 
but also for some difficult times that he faced, um, both uh, some mistakes that he made. And that's actually where I found your story, um, not beyond the broadcasting world, but uh, your interview with Brian Gumbel um, just a couple of months ago and reaching out to you because you did then take it in your own hands. You took your faith in your own hands. And I believe it was actually your son who said, Dad, we're going to make some change. In our tradition, in the Hebrew, it's called teshuva. It means repentance, but it really means to move into yourself. Maybe share how your son allowed you for that reawakening to say, you know what, we're going to make a change here. Well, a couple of things happened. Uh, you know, after Sarah had passed away, my my teammates at Duke, everybody was incredibly supportive of me through my grief. But they saw me drinking the way I was, and they gave me a hall pass on that for about two years. And then they tried to have an intervention for me, and I was not receiving that message at that time. You know, I, I said, look, I know I got issues. I can handle it. I can deal with it. You know, and I let my ego get in the way, um, you know, just the, the bulletproof mentality that athletes and people have. Um, and and then, you know, as time went on, COVID really was the thing that put me over the top. I was basically in my apartment, isolated and drinking all day long until I passed out. And then I'd wake up and do the same thing. A couple of months before, um, I, you know, I thought I was being real tricky and I was throwing some wine bottles out in the back to try to not build up the mm -hmm. uh, build up the recycling. And uh, my son found them and I was I went out and it came back and he had gotten all these dirty wine bottles and lined them up on the table and said, Dad, I love you. I want to help you. And, um, you know, we had uh, we had an intervention in um, in late in late June. And, uh, you know, he sat, the, he sat the, the computer in front of me and it was a Zoom intervention with uh, the people down at Rebound. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was ready then. I was, um, that moment of clarity came over me. I was, I knew, I, I was just waiting for somebody to, to do this. I didn't have the strength to do it myself. And thank God for my son. Um, we have an amazing relationship now and I had one before that or else, you know, I don't think this would have happened. Mm -hmm. So here's an interview on The Fault um, about who sent you to Rebound. And we'll talk about Rebound after. Concurrently. Jason Williams, mm -hmm. who was, you know, once you played with him in the NBA and now he's your counselor. Mm -hmm. How is that? How is, you know? It was like God was he steered me down here i fully believe that and you know jason was a rookie when i was with the sixers right so and he was like a <laughs> unbroken cult back then you know just so full energy and yeah. he would go back to new york city from philly every chance he got and um you know he was it was interesting seeing him on that end but yeah. then just so ironic that i would come to him for help you know all these years later right. and i knew well you know I, felt completely comfortable with him in the program uh, and it just made sense on on every level let's talk about jason williams for a second uh maybe you can talk about the change in him that you saw right literally imprisoned for um homicide and yep. then changes his life around and now helps others uh seeing him do that maybe talk about that process and then how that led, as you said, ironic uh, in our tradition. I keep using these some Hebrew words, but hashkachat pratit means uh, divine intervention. Um, <laughs> that, as you said, God steered you to that place, but maybe also God steered Jason Williams to be your teammate in those many years ago. So yeah, and, and, and we've laughed about that, Ares. And, uh, you know, it was, it was with Jason, and we've talked a lot about, you know, his time in prison. He spent 27 months there, came out, was... Um, you know, was not in a in a great place, and um, he was in a he was in a house up in uh, the Catskills, isolated out in the woods, just drinking all day long. He blew up to like three hundred and thirty pounds, and um, one guy who was close to Charles Oakley, and another guy Curtis Martin, who uh, great running back with New England and the Jets, and Hall of Famer, and he actually leads our um, our prayer group every Wednesday. Oh, wow. Um, but but Curtis and Oak went up to the house and Oakley actually had a baseball bat with him. <laughs> and 
you know, Jason, he went willingly. They brought him down to Florida to, you know, put him in patient. And they asked him what the baseball bat was for. And Oak said, you were coming with us one way or the other. <laughs> and, uh, and if you know Oakley, that's, you know, that, that's right in his wheelhouse. But, um, yeah. you know, Jason's been sober for seven plus years now. And uh, he's doing amazing work down at Rebound. And uh, it was just so... You know, it, it, it was cosmic and it was God driven that I should reunite with him after our first meeting. So here's a quick video of uh, Jason Williams and uh, you coming together at Rebound. I'm Jason Williams, former NBA All-Star. Mike Chavinsky, not an All-Star. <laughs> <laughs> We're both passionate about Rebound and sobriety. Let's go. Well, I'm passionate about sobriety. I'm passionate about helping people, but I'm more passionate about my routine. I go to bed at 8.30. Uh, I wake up at 3.25. I have no alarm clock. Uh, passion wakes me up every morning. And the first thing I do when I get to our farm, which is a farm here, um, is I let the chickens out. So I think that line that Jason says, passion wakes me up in the morning, is yep. an unbelievable line of faith. Um, what passion wakes you up in the morning? I don't know if it's 3.30 in the morning like him, but how does that work? Yeah, we have a little different internal clock, but not uh, not that far off <laughs> there. The, uh, you know, and for, for Jason, I mean, the thing, he lives, he's got a condo down by the beach, and the cell that he was in in, in prison was so small that it was wow. just a, really a claustrophobic nightmare for him. So every morning when he gets up at that time, he first thing he does is goes out to the beach just for free space and to enjoy God and to, you know, watch the sunrise and, and just have that every single day. Um, and, you know, what what they pass along down at Rebound is uh, the adventure therapy, just mm -hmm. getting you outside your comfort zone. And for me, that was manifested in skydiving, which I... <laughs> which I had never done. And uh, after having done it down there, it was the most amazing experience that I've individually had. Um, and really, again, it reinforced me as like, you know, I, I went skydiving, I can do this, I can deal with addiction, you know, you don't ever get cured. Mm -hmm. But I, I can deal with this on a daily basis. And uh, that's, that's what that treatment is all about. So take that passion to the sports world, right? When you're involved actively in professional sports, you have to have the passion. If somebody doesn't have a passion, they're not surviving that. And then the sports world ends and all of a sudden, you know, a 14 year career in any other business is not long. Right. And then like, now what? Um, mm -hmm. Take us to the broadcasting career for a moment. Was there a passion there? I remember uh, watching a little clip that said they threw the headset on you and there you went. Uh, you know, I was trained in public speaking. That's my profession. Uh, what did that look like? And what is that like to share other stories, right? When you're on the air, um, what do you want to share with the audience to allow them not just to enjoy a game, but also to really learn something deeper about humanity? I, I guess the, you know, the, the biggest lesson or one of the best words of wisdom that I ever received when I first got into broadcasting was to be yourself. Mm-hmm and be true to yourself be true to your nature don't try to invent something that you're not that you won't be able to sustain and i, I think that's probably the the biggest thing that i've been able to do and especially now in recovery as you know my story is is out there um mm -hmm. and you you know you having me on uh, you know as a guest allows me to to tell where i've been and where i am and uh you know i think just by being transparent and being open um, has, has brought me closer to God and, and given me a lot more strength. And I just try to let that come through on every broadcast, every opportunity that I have to speak about it. That's actually interesting. One of my first guests was Dave Sims. I've probably worked with him in the past. Good, and, good uh, friend of mine, yep. Yeah, he's fantastic. And he said, uh, you know, Faith in sports is, you know, when they say, I thank God for winning. Well, the left fielder doesn't thank God for losing. So what actually do you see the role of faith in the game, right? Often when you're going to interview a player after you interview Buddy Beheim after Buddy Buckets, you know, six thirty-five. Oh, I thank God. Well, you're not thanking God after he loses. So what do you see the role? Like actually, we talked about the pregame, right? On the court, maybe the after game, we thank God for allowing us to play. But 
is there a role of faith actually in the moments of sports? Yeah, I, I think you you were uh, you know, and that's the thing that has expanded for me as well the uh, the, the act of gratitude and mm-hmm. uh, the gra- the act of being thankful for being healthy, the the gift of another day, and the gift of being able to you know live my life in you know as as to His will, and uh, you know, and, and <coughs> you know, one of the things too that I've learned is that you know you. You have to, God is there through, you know, losing 12 games in a row or winning 12 games in a row. And you have, you know, you can't just be thankful when things are good. You have to be thankful in any circumstance. And that's certainly, you know, he, and he was with me when I was drinking, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I know that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and certainly was there when I decided to make a change in my life. So you quickly mentioned the prayer circle with Curtis Martin and I believe Oakley and, uh, what does that look like? Is that your rebound? Is that just a personal group of uh, athletes it, that are praying? Jason, uh, Jason, and um, and Curtis started it a, a number of years ago, and um, it's every Wednesday down at Rebound. We call it Wellness Wednesday. Um, oh, I love it. I love it, it. It starts out with um, a prayer group at eight forty-five, and Curtis Curtis leads it and goes on for about an hour, hour and a half or so and interaction there. It's a, it's a, a, a call and uh, there are probably 70 people on the call at any one time, but all uh-huh. of us are on a speaker phone at rebound. And it's people who have been through that program, alumni and, and other people who've, you know, who've just like to jump on and get some, uh, get some encouraging words and get some scripture and, uh, you know, in the middle of the week. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fabulous. And, uh, and even, you know, now I'm I'm a part of it. Every Wednesday, I'll jump on wherever I am and and be a part of that group. And I know, look, uh, as my dad used to say, it's only like when when my teams used to lose, right? It's only a game, right? But okay. is it only a game to a college basketball player, to a professional basketball player? Is it more than a game, or what is this role of sports actually in our world, specifically in the American society today? And actually. Over these past two years, number one, last year when you were doing games in empty arenas, uh, what has that hope and faith uh, brought back when the, you know, when Cameron's a full house in the, a, a, a Duke game now? I, th- you know, I think the the big thing is that, yeah, it's it is. It, I mean, it's not certainly not life and death, but that being said, <laughs> it's, um, you know, you you you're very competitive as an athlete. You don't. You're out there in front of twenty thousand people. You don't want to, you know, be cavalier about how you approach it. You're with a team. You're trying to win. You're trying to do things the right way. Um, and you know, and and like I said, I you know, I've you talked about you know thanking God after all that, and I've I've never done that for that very reason that. You know that there. I'm I'm thankful for other things, not for the fact that I scored 30 points or the fact that we won the game. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so. Um, but the but the other the other side of that is is that that competitive nature which I had to which you have to have to be a, a you know compete on that level, and also to get to the network level in broadcasting worked against me because I thought that I was more powerful than addiction. Mm. And that really led to my downward spiral. And talk about now that you've, you know, you said this is never cured, but you, you, you live with something. Mm -hmm. Um, The other either athletes or people that now you have inspired to also either do an intervention or find that hope, inspiration and faith. Um, How, has that felt on the other side, just as Jason led to you. Now I go back to the metaphor of you Dawkins and Reddick, right? Yep. So now Jason led to you, you lead to somebody else. How does that feel? And uh, what's your work look like there with Reed? Well, Dawkins? it's, you know, Arizona, and I tell people that the thing that's worked for me is to, uh, of mindfulness and being in the moment and being present every mm-hmm. single day. Uh, if I were to sit down and say, I'm never drinking for the rest of my life, that would be one overwhelming and two unrealistic. Uh-huh. But so I've, I've decided to say, I'm going to, I'm not going to drink today. Mm, that's nice. every day that I get up. That's the decision. I'm going to pray 
and make that decision. And I can, I can manage 24 hours, you know, the rest of my life is, you know, is another thing and who knows how long that's going to be, but I can, I can manage this day and I'm very grateful for every single day. You're writing a lot of sermons for me because that one is called a Hayom. Hayom means today. And actually on our high holy day season, we say that word over and over again. And right, well, what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, I don't know, because as you just said, Hayom, it's actually about this moment. Obviously, you can prepare for tomorrow, but mm-hmm. you live actually um, in this moment as well. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I saw yeah. a great like, I saw a great saying that said, you know, just spend time where your feet are. Yeah. And you know, and when we as a as a culture so taken with social media and everybody having their face in a in a cell phone we're not in the moment we're somewhere else or we're in the future or we're thinking about the past and the, the moment gets lost i feel a little crazy that you said that because i'm going to move this way and that book behind me is by scott o'neill former ceo of the 76ers be where your feet are yeah. uh he just wrote that book this year so it's uh <laughs> pretty crazy um and then how about this last question of we talked about faith in the sports world but do you think that sports is actually needed in the faith world And I say that um, my senior rabbi, Rabbi David Wolfe, we had a conversation the other day saying that you should take faith where people are, right? That basically Mm -hmm. don't just come into the synagogue and into the church, but they, what we do in our daily life should include a moment of faith. Um, So do you see those connecting in any way or do you say, you know what, we separate them and the kids play basketball and then they go to synagogue and church? No, I, I definitely think there's a, a place for it in sports. And because, you know, that would then lead you to say, I'm leaving my faith behind when mm-hmm. I go out and play. And then I'm just going to put it, I'm going to go to my locker, get dressed and put my faith back in me and, you know, go. I, it can't work that way. So, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, that has to be a part of you. We talked about the, uh, the study groups before the games where, we invite our own teammates to come. We invite the other team to come, tell them where it's going to be. Um, you know, so it's a very inclusive thing. And, you know, you see, you see athletes shake hands after games or hug, right. and there's a, there's a lot of respect there. Mm-hmm. And there's also a lot of shared spirituality as, as well. Right. And so I, I don't think you, I don't think, you know, I, I can't disconnect myself from my faith. Um, Yes, it's it's with me all the time. And I, you know, I, I like to, you know, shine God through me in how I conduct myself every 24 mm-hmm. hours. Well, I love that. I love that. Shine God through you every day of our lives. That is an amazing, amazing moment right there. And actually, my favorite, my favorite uh, thing of the year is the montage of one shining moment. And I think actually to end the basketball season each year, for me, that's a moment of faith right? Like one shining moment, as you said before, that each day, each moment, God should shine uh, within each of our souls as well. We, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And, and, you know, you see it in the faces, the the joy, the Mm -hmm. sorrow, uh, the, you know, the, the pain, Uh, there's, there's a gamut of emotions and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all through God. We are so thrilled that uh, Michael Jaminski has joined us from ACC Network, NBA veteran, and as we just heard this morning, truly, truly a man of faith. Mike, it's so wonderful to meet you. We hope that when you're out here doing some broadcasts, uh, Pac-12 and NCAA tournament, you visit us here at Signing Temple in Los Angeles Jewish community. Mike, God bless. Thanks so much. God bless. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me on.